things come to us surprisingly when we need them. And that was the case when I met her. I had no idea, no idea that she would be the one to give me permission to look at the battle inside myself with new eyes and eventually gratitude. Her name is Etty Hillisum, and she ushered me into an exploration of presence, not with shiny boxes and ribbons, and not exactly what we think of as stage presence, but the kind of presence that invites our fears and contradictions out into the open so that we can express our deepest creativity. As an actor, director, and communication coach for people all over the world, I'm always interested in this question of presence because for me, I had no idea how to be present with myself. So growing up, the way I thought I had to be, I was supposed to be, was happy and confident. And that was the face I showed you. But there was a battle going on underneath. I had this belief that if I wasn't happy and confident, bad things would happen. I'd fail. I wouldn't be loved. So the more I tried to be happy and confident, the less I felt happy and confident. It was like a prison. And then strange things started to happen. For a while, I didn't recognize myself in the mirror for about six months. I had become unfamiliar with myself. At one point, I didn't recognize whose hands were on the steering wheel. I had a cast of characters in my head arguing about how the script of my life should go. I'm panicking. Pull it together. Don't be a mess. People don't like messes. Do you need people to like you? Um, well, you know, sometimes, okay, whatever you do, do not fail. Oh my God, I'm gonna fail. Ooh, that could be bad. Okay, I'm not gonna fail. Ooh, that could be bad too. People don't like it when you're too successful. They could be angry. Don't let other people's anger push you around. What are you, weak? I am not weak. I am not weak. You are a mess. Don't think about this. Don't talk about this. Definitely don't do a public speech about it. Oh my God. You are fine. You are happy and confident. <laughs> So, it's funny now. Um, so I lived at that intersection for a long time. And I thought I had two choices, right? Either or, it's not really a choice. Either I shut it down or I get consumed by it. And it was Etty who showed me through presence that I could have a creative relationship with myself. And then that might change my relationship to the world. So hers was a voice that was meant to be totally annihilated. September 7th, 1943, Etty Hillisum, a Dutch Jew, is packed onto a Nazi transport train along with her family. The train headed for Auschwitz, Poland, to the death camps, passes by an open field. Etty throws a postcard out of the window of the train. A farmer in a field picks it up. The postcard reads, I am sitting on my rucksack in the middle of a full freight car. Father, mother, and Misha are a few cars away. In the end, the departure came without warning. Thank you for your kindness and care. We left the camp singing. Huh? I mean, I needed to understand how this woman could sing on the way to her death in Auschwitz. Okay, this was a person who had problems before the war. I mean, she was sometimes depressed. She was periodically suicidal. She didn't know how many men she wanted to date. I mean, it was a lot. Just like all of us struggling. And then this war comes along. How did she become someone so grateful 
for her life amidst unimaginable torture. And I thought, you know what? If she could find a way through, I can give it a whirl. I'm not suicidal. I'm not facing a Holocaust, but I am having a modern day existential crisis. So I poured over the journals, the diaries and letters of Etty, poured over them to learn from them. And finally, I decided I wanted to make a play about it. So myself and two very gifted artists and a wonderful collaborative team created and produced the world premiere, the world premiere of The Wrestling Patient in Boston. Etty says that the main difficulty in writing about her life is a sense of shame, fear of letting go. So she, on, on, on instructions from her mentor, decides that she's going to write everything down, unedited, messy. And through this process, she begins to liberate herself from the inside by facing what she refers to as her inner battlefield. So I want to read a few things to you about what she experiences on her inner battlefield. An incident with a German friend, her housemate, Kati. Sometimes, when I read the newspapers, I'm suddenly beside myself with anger, cursing, and swearing at the Germans. This is Etty. And I know I do it deliberately in order to hurt Kati, even if it is against a dear friend. I can't bear the thought that she can't share my hatred. And then I nastily say to her, your whole nation must be destroyed, root and branch. They are all scum. And then I feel terribly ashamed and deeply unhappy. On another incident, at the pharmacy, a man poked me with his finger. Are you allowed to have that? Yes, sir. Jews are still allowed toothpaste. Headaches, stomach aches, the feeling of being crushed under a heavy weight. Mortal fear in every fiber, complete collapse, lack of self-confidence, aversion, panic. Okay, so even if you haven't been in the middle of a battlefield, we know what shock feels like. We know humiliation, fury. If you've grown up in a, a dangerous neighborhood, losing a parent at an early age, dealing with an illness, being bullied, even being betrayed by a friend, when that wave of feeling comes over us, the last thing we do is want to become present. We don't want to look. We want to shove it away or we get consumed in it. And Etty's the same way. She has no power over Jewish stars and curfews, but she wants to have power over her heart. This is her battle. Even in these circumstances, to become unlimited, to have power over her heart. And what does she do? She does what we all do at the beginning when we are facing something difficult and it's unfair. She resists. So this is from the wrestling patient. I'm not ready. I don't know anything about war. Big events caused by insignificant men. Men who, if they wrote books, I wouldn't read them. Men I wouldn't sleep with, so by my standards, I shouldn't even be in their war. But here I am, yelling, fighting, praying like everybody else. So here's the moment that she stops resisting and she's going to make a choice to do something, to open, even though she doesn't know where it's going to go. She opens a space. She says, teach me to change. I want to stop the war within me, to cut out all the little cowardices and violences in which I am participating so that I can confront this war up close no matter who it resides in. So in this moment, she realizes, okay, there's two wars. 
There's one out here, and there's one in here, and I can start to work on this. I still have agency. So how does she do it? How does she work with presence? So this is her battlefield inside her journal. This is where she avails herself. And she doesn't just write down the things that she wants to think about herself. She gives space to everything, and that's the beginning, to welcome it, to give all those things that we war with inside ourselves a space to struggle and be accommodated and come to rest. Can we be big enough? The next thing she does is she realizes, you know what, if I numb my pain, I'm probably going to numb my joy because they live in the same neighborhood. She brings compassion and stillness into her turning inward. She turns inward. She makes a practice of it. Okay, so I just want to say um, there would be a lot less anger in the world and probably several million therapists out of a job if we all just knew how to turn inward with compassion, right? It's something that can be learned and Etty gets help. And what she finds is that the more she opens up to her suffering, the more room she has to experience beauty. So even though her outer circumstances become extremely limited, really limited, her inner is not. And she brings all of the love that she has cultivated within herself into the camps, a tremendous inner resource. And for the year or so that she is in Westerbork Transit Camp, she makes a difference in people's lives because now she can bear exquisite witness to them with exquisite presence. So I just want to read you a little bit about what she says her letters from Westerbork Transit Camp. The misery here is quite terrible. And yet, late at night, when the day has slunk away into the depths behind me, I often walk with a spring in my step along the barbed wire. And then it soars straight from my heart. I can't help it. The feeling that life is glorious and magnificent right before our eyes. Mass murder. But the sky is full of birds. The purple lupins stand up so regally. Two old women have sat down on a box for a chat. The sun is shining on my face. We may suffer, but we must not succumb. So I see this radical journey in two gestures. The willingness to turn inward and open and make space for all of who we are. The choice to throw a postcard out into a field. In that, I see someone saying, I'm willing to be present. She bet on humanity, hers and ours. Do we ever know the value of our innermost choices? Do we ever know that the battle that we are fighting in our own private lives could help someone else? Etty could not have known that her journals and letters would reach forward and touch my life. So if you find yourself at the intersection of confused and struggling, turn inward. Throw postcards, because in the end, we never know who we touch. Thank you.